This is video number four in our series about presbyopia, exploring why is it that people need reading glasses and what other options are there. Presbyopia is the need for reading glasses that imposes itself on just about everyone sometime after age 40. In youth, for most people, reading is effortless. Print is nice and sharp. But sometime after age 40, print looks more like this. Brighter light helps for a while, but at some point, you need help with reading glasses. For most people, this is their first landmark of aging. There is an exception. For those with myopia, otherwise known as nearsightedness, it is functionally equal to having built-in reading glasses. But they don't totally escape. Their distance glasses neutralize the advantage, and then myopes become the same as everyone else. Because presbyopia is essentially universal, a lot of effort has gone into developing alternatives to glasses. Our exploration into presbyopia is divided into three detailed subject videos and one summary video. Video number one covers why presbyopia happens and standard treatment with glasses. Video number two covers new treatments using eye drops you may already be seeing TV commercials for one of these. Video three discusses surgical treatments, both new ones and some that have been around for a while. This is video number four, in which we aim to summarize the main concepts about presbyopia, leaving out some background details. These are the time points if you wish to choose a particular subject. We start with a bit of background on how the eye focuses. In the sense that your eye works like a camera, light rays from a distant object are brought to a focus by the cornea and lens, forming an image on the retina in the back of the eye. The ideal of sharp focus is called emetropia and relates to distance vision. Refractive error like myopia and hyperopia is discussed in other videos. If this is the setup for distance vision, what happens when you want to see up close? As you bring an object closer to you, the image moves backwards, falling behind the retina, out of focus. In order to keep the focus on the retina, you need to add focusing power. In the eye, the focusing muscles contract, which causes the lens to change shape, which adds the needed power. The mechanism that controls the change of focus is simple on first viewing, but a little more complex in the details. The ciliary body contains a ring of muscles surrounding the lens, which controls lens shape. The geometry is set up such that, in distance focus, the focusing muscles are in their relaxed state. Because the ciliary muscle is attached to the sclera, when it is relaxed, the zonules exert an outward pull on the lens, keeping its shape relatively flatter. When you want to see up close, the ciliary muscles contract, so the zonules relax their pull on the lens. That allows the lens to assume its preferred rounder shape, which results in increased focusing power. That is the summary version of the classic consensus model. To be complete, the ability to read and see up close involves more than just a change in lens focus, which is one step of a three-step process called accommodation. Part one is ciliary body contraction to change the lens shape, adding plus power. Part two is constriction of the pupils, resulting in an increase in depth of field. Part three is contraction of the middle external muscles of the eyes. This action turns the eyes inward, which maintains alignment on the near object. If the eyes remained parallel, like they are at distance, each eye would be looking at a different object up close. Thus, accommodation for focus at near has three parts which are linked together. This whole mechanism works very well in youth, but nothing lasts forever. Part two. Now that we know how the mechanism of focusing works, 
What changes that makes presbyopia happen? This is the focusing power of the lens presented in traditional form, showing how it changes over your life. When you are young, reading is easy because you have a lot of focusing power in reserve, about 14 diopters. But over time, the lens loses flexibility and the ability to focus up close declines until, at some point, usually in the early 40s, it becomes noticeably more difficult to focus up close and you need help with reading glasses, known as presbyopia. By the late 50s, lens flexibility is about gone. That last diopter of accommodation is probably from pupil constriction and increased depth of field, rather than from an effect of the lens. Why does presbyopia happen? Of the multiple structures and actions involved in accommodation, does the problem lie with the lens, or is it the focusing muscles, or something else? The classic explanation for reduced accommodation is loss of flexibility of the natural lens. Just looking at the lens as it ages, we can see the color change from clear to yellow to orange to brown. On one hand, this is part of cataract development. For the purpose of this discussion, the lens also becomes harder. Researchers have studied both the lens and the ciliary body as they change with age. Regarding the lens, we can measure its thickness and diameter. Regarding the ciliary body, we can measure the diameter of the muscular ring, its thickness, and contractility. One prominent study took these measurements using MRI images. In our model, with normal accommodation, the ciliary muscle ring narrows, lens diameter decreases, and lens thickness increases. For our purposes, we are interested in how these dimensions change with age. Starting with the diameter of the lens. This graph shows how the lens diameter changes with accommodation. Before age 40, the lens diameter changes, that is, decreases about a half a millimeter with accommodation. You can see how that decreases over time until sometime around age, age 50, lens diameter no longer changes with accommodation. Then, the thickness of the lens. We see the change in lens thickness follows a similar pattern, gradually decreasing with time. Again, sometime in the mid-50s, the lens shows no change. Put another way, sometime in the mid-50s, the lens has lost all of its flexibility. During that same time, how is the ciliary muscle doing? This is the diameter of the ring created by the ciliary muscle. Again, we see the change in ring diameter is decreasing over time. But the change does not go to zero. This is one piece of evidence that the ciliary muscle is still contracting. Here is a more recent study that uses OCT scanning for a more detailed view of the ciliary body. Their results graph shows the thickness of the ciliary muscle increases as it contracts with accommodation, as we expect. Here, the thickness measurements did not appear to change with time. In other words, the ciliary muscle is showing about the same amount of contractility at all ages, at least in this study. All that shows that the ciliary muscle is still contracting years after the lens is no longer able to respond by changing its shape. Now, we know why we can't see up close. What are we going to do about it? In order to plan treatment strategies, we need to think about what is happening in our visual world. Daily life does not happen at only one distance. Rather, we have three targets to plan for. First, objects at distance. 
Second, lots of things in life happen at arm's length, like reading sheet music or painting, or in our modern world, computer screens. Third, reading and near work, as with the artist's father reading a newspaper. Before we move on, what is unique here? This gentleman appears to have reached the age of presbyopia, but he is reading without glasses. Is it artist discretion? Is he nearsighted? Or is he just reading the large print? Those paintings illustrate the range of vision a young emetrope can handle with their wide range of accommodation. With presbyopia comes the question of how are we going to address all three distances? The simplest and least invasive method for treating presbyopia is correction with glasses or contact lenses. The concept involves in some way using plus lens power to help with near focus. Glasses options come in two categories, single vision and multifocal, depending on what your needs are. A single vision distance lens works well for a young person who only needs distance correction, either for near or farsightedness. For a presbyope, this is useful for the times when they don't want a multifocal, say while playing sports like golf or tennis. For, re for reading, if you are a presbyope, you could have just single vision reading glasses. And if you have only a small distance prescription, then the over-the-counter readers are a handy option. But there are caveats. First, reading glasses are only good for up close. You have to take them off to see distance. Second, if you have a significant distance prescription, they work less well. Prescription readers include correction for the distance prescription. For most presbyopes, the convenience of being able to leave glasses on leads to multifocal lenses. Distance vision through the top of the lens and reading through the bottom. Traditional bifocals have a small half-moon reading segment that could be extended across the bottom half of the lens, but that's less common now. Both of these leave out intermediate distance, which could be covered by a trifocal, not shown here. Most people, for a long time now, go with progressive lenses. In these lenses, the power increases gradually as your eye travels down the lens, so you can be in focus at any distance, including intermediate. So this does a good job of addressing the range of visual needs. Just like the glasses options, there are multiple contact lens choices, starting with single vision, soft and hard lenses. For presbyopia, there are multifocal lenses. Interestingly, there is also a bifocal contact lens with either a flat lower edge that rides on the lower eyelid or a weighted lower edge to keep it oriented, but they haven't been that popular. Alternatively, one can go to a monovision setup. Monovision is the term for having a different correction in each eye. With contacts, it would be single vision lenses, usually fitting the dominant eye for distance and the non-dominant eye for reading. Yes, a different focus for each eye. Surprisingly, people seem to adapt to this difference fairly well. It does not address intermediate range and there is some reduction in stereo vision. This can also be done with refractive surgery, like LASIK in one eye, or choosing lens implants. But some people find wearing glasses to be a nuisance. One new alternative is using drops to help with presbyopia. This is covered in depth in video number two. With medications, there are two strategies to help with reading vision. The first is pupil constriction, which works by the pinhole effect. The second is lens softening, returning at least some flexibility of focus. Here is the presbyopic eye trying to see up close. Loss of flexibility means the lens is unable to summon enough focusing power, so the image focus falls behind the retina, 
leaving a blurred image at the retina. If we make the pupil smaller, the blur circle on the retina gets smaller, meaning the image is some amount sharper. Another way to look at the effect of a pinhole, as camera users know, is that the depth of field increases as the size of the opening, or aperture, gets smaller. Thus, we see treatments, both medical and surgical, based on the pinhole effect. Meiosis is the technical term for a small pupil, and drops that make the pupil small are called meiotics, the opposite of the dilating drops like you have with an eye exam. Practically then, what can we expect a pinhole to do for your ability to read? To get a handle on this, we need a way to measure near vision. This is a near vision testing card that many of, many of us use in practice. It gives a range of print sizes in point size, Jaeger notation, and Snellen equivalent. Under age 40, most people can read the small print at the bottom, equivalent of 2020. Over time, as near vision decreases, somewhere around 2040, things start to get more difficult in everyday life. With reading glasses, you could get back to the equivalent of 2020, but some people find them a nuisance. So what else can be done? What if you could use eye drops instead and get to, say, the 2025 level? That would get you to a reasonably comfortable place. Can such a thing be done with eye drops? To understand how the meiotic drops work, the following is a brief review of how pupil size is controlled. There are two sets of muscles in the iris, both located in back just in front of the pigmented layer. There is a circular or sphincter muscle that goes around the pupil. When the sphincter contracts, the pupil gets smaller, typically in response to light or accommodation. Outside the sphincter are the radial or dilator muscles. When they contract, they pull the pupil more open. They are under control of the sympathetic fight-or-flight nervous system. Pupil size at any one time is a balance between sphincter and dilator activity. These are the principal transmitters that control pupil size. We include the ciliary muscles because, like the sphincter muscle, they respond to cholinergic medications and will partake in side effects. To put pupil size in perspective, let's look at normal pupil size, which it turns out decreases with age. By age 45, average pupil size in light is less than 4 millimeters. How does that relate to vision? What we are looking at here is how pupil size affects depth of field. Larger pupil sizes on the right getting smaller toward the left. Above 2 millimeters, as pupil size decreases, there's a mild, gradual increase in depth of field. However, when pupil size drops below 2 millimeters, depth of field increases rapidly. That result is the basis of the pinhole strategy. Back to our aging graph, the target for a small pupil is less than 2 millimeters, but we don't want the pupil to be too small. That causes light to diffract or spread out, and it reduces the amount of light getting into the eye. One author estimated 1.3 millimeters as the best compromise between depth of field and diffraction. Translating that to medications, option one is sphincter activation. These are the three headliners. They are well known to us because they were used for glaucoma treatment. Technically, this is the cholinergic family. Option two, agents that block the dilator muscle, leaving the sphincter unopposed. These are the two main agents that inhibit the iris dilator muscles, technically affecting the adrenergic system. They have also found use in reducing low-light visual symptoms. 
Let's talk a little about side effects. For the cholinergic drops, it turns out the ciliary body and the pupil sphincter share the same kind of receptors. 1. Strong contraction of the ciliary body muscles can cause aching of the eye with initial use. 2. Since these are the focusing muscles, their activation causes a shift in focus to near, otherwise known as inducing myopia. Third, because the pupil is smaller, less light gets into the eye, so it is harder to read in low light and night vision is reduced. They also make the pupil harder to dilate, which makes it more difficult to examine the inside of the eye. Four, pilocarpine has the rare complication of retinal detachment. Five, these drops may relate to chronic inflammation in the eye, so some formulations pair them with an anti-inflammatory drop. Minimizing ciliary body activation is where acyclidine may have an advantage. Equal effect on the pupil, but less effect on the ciliary body. More about that when we talk specifically about acyclidine. For the adrenergic drops, bromonidine causes oral dryness and ocular allergy, among other things. As of the end of 2021, phentolamine drops have not received FDA approval, so we don't have a package insert for reference. This is a representative sampling of the drop development landscape, which includes pilocarpine, acyclidine, dilation blockers, combination drops, and a lens softening drop. We will pick one example from each group and look at the trial results showing how well they work. The FDA has recently granted approval for the first medication for presbyopia treatment, pilocarpine, under the brand name Vuity. Excerpts from the package insert repeat the pilocarpine issues we covered earlier. How well do these drops work? The typical threshold set for comparing vision results is what percentage of people increased reading by three or more lines on a near vision chart without a decrease in distance vision? Then a second question is, how long does the effect last after drop installation? These are their results. At the one hour mark, about 40% met the three line threshold of vision improvement. By three hours, that dropped to 30% versus 8% with placebo. The difference was statistically significant. Dosing is suggested at one drop in each eye per day. Another sphincter activating agent is acyclidine. Initially known as a glaucoma treatment in the same category as the other cholinergics, pilocarpine and carbacol. It is distinguished by the effects on meiosis and induced myopia. The common concentrations of these drops all result in essentially the same small pupil size, the desirable result. Whereas, the amount of induced myopia is much less with acyclidine. That means less activation of the ciliary body. Same small pupil size with less myopia, you can see why there is interest in this drop. Moving on to category two, medications that interfere with the dilator muscles. Starting with the combination drop, carbacol to activate the sphincter muscle plus bromonidine to inhibit the dilator muscle. While this FDA trial has not yet posted results, we have data on this combination from a study done in 2016. It looked at the effects of carbacol and bromonidine by themselves and in combination. Bromonidine, the purple column, by itself shows minimal effect on reading ability. And the effect of carbacol in green, by itself, is modest, getting only to J5 or J6 at one hour. Applying both drops separately in red makes an improvement to J3 to 4 at one hour. Interestingly, the combination drop, the blue columns, makes a significant improvement, this time to J1 at one hour. 
Compared to the print size we started with, this is a notable improvement both statistically and practically. And the combination holds its effect pretty well through eight hours. We switch now to an entirely different method of drop treatment for presbyopia, restoring some degree of flexibility to the lens. This is much earlier in development. How is it that eye drops could possibly soften the lens? For our purposes here, the clarity of the lens comes from the regular organization of crystalline proteins in the lens cells. For the lens to be flexible as an accommodation, those proteins need to be able to slide around one another. They are indeed very squishy in youth, but with time, one of the things that happens is that the protein molecules become attached to one another by sulfur to sulfur bonds. Those protein to protein attachments cause clumping. That relates to the loss of lens clarity and they make the lens less able to flex. It turns out that lipoic acid is a molecule that can break these disulfide bonds and allow the proteins in the lens more freedom of movement. It is delivered as lipoic acid with an ester connection to choline, which is broken once it passes through the cornea to the inside of the eye, allowing the lipoic acid to go to work on the lens. Just this year, they published the full results of that early trial. Participants got the drop for the first 90 days and then were followed. Without going to de into details, in general, vision improved in the treatment group and the effect lasted for months after stopping the drops. Novartis has taken over development and renamed the drug UNR844. It has finished one trial and has another ongoing. As of the end of 2021, we are awaiting results. For our last section, we move on to surgical treatments of presbyopia. Some of these are new procedures and some have been around for a while. They are covered in more detail in video number three. The general categories include LASIK procedures, corneal inlays, lens exchange, and procedures on the sclera. One comment before we proceed. Consider this is different from other eye surgeries like cataract surgery, where you are starting with impaired vision and trying to improve it. Refractive surgery involves taking the risk of operating on an otherwise healthy eye to get rid of the need and annoyance of glasses. Keep that in mind as we go, on, go through the various technologies. Beginning with LASIK. People usually think about LASIK as used to correct myopia and small amounts of hyperopia, but it is also being used for presbyopia. There are several LASIK options for presbyopia, monofocal and multifocal. LASIK can create monovision by making the central cornea steeper, creating myopia on purpose. To achieve a multifocal result, the cornea has to have two contours, one for distance and one for reading. These are the various treatment zones and the modalities for each. We will pick one as an example, the AMO VizX, in the central near group. This study is from Canada, published in 2011. They treated 66 eyes that were both hyperopic and presbyopic, using a blended approach to address both problems. Their results, first, regarding distance vision. The average beginning refraction was near plus two diopters. The average ending refraction was within a half diopter of emetropia. Second, regarding near vision, over 80% had a gain of one or more lines. Almost 50% gained three lines or more. For the patients, that meant reduced use of glasses for both distance and near. For the next strategy, we move to a different kind of corneal surgery. In this case, implanting a device within the cornea itself. Besides using a laser to evaporate surface tissue, as with LASIK, 
It can also be used to create a pocket in the cornea. In this procedure, this is usually done about mid-depth. Into this pocket, they insert a device, disc-shaped, small in size, made of a biocompatible material. One example is the camera inlay. It is a flat, opaque disc, just under 4 millimeters in diameter, with a central hole of 1.6 millimeters. Within the disc are thousands of micro holes to allow diffusion of molecules within the cornea. The way this works on vision is by the pinhole effect. Two notes here. First, the camera inlay is placed in only one eye, the non-dominant eye, making it a version of monovision. Second, this requires uncorrected distance vision of near emetropia. How well does this work? In a trial of 508 subjects, over 80% reached the 2040 level of near vision. Adverse effects of various kinds occurred in just over one third of eyes by three years out. 44 patients, just under 9%, required removal of the inlay. The biggest reason for removal was related to vision, particularly hyperopic shift. Reviewers for the FDA found visual improvement was enough to outweigh the risks and approved the device in 2015. There is another procedure that aims to reshape the cornea by a process called conductive keratoplasty, or CK. The CK probe uses radio frequency energy directed through the tip to heat a small area of cornea causing the collagen to shrink. The result of shrinking the peripheral collagen is to increase the curvature of the central cornea, adding plus reading power. Unfortunately, the effect fades with time and it is rarely used now. For the next set of surgical options, we move to the inside of the eye. In this case, we are looking at replacing the natural lens with an artificial one or adding a new lens. The technology to remove the lens and replace it with a technological marvel that is the lens implant has been refined into a high art in cataract surgery. Our goal here is not to provide a detailed discussion of lens implants, but to give you a summary of the concepts. Lens implants are covered in detail in a separate video. There are three categories of lens implants, single power, multifocal, and flexible. Each has its own particular properties we will briefly discuss. First and simplest, the single power lens implant with one focal distance. It gives a high level of image quality, good performance in low light, and is the least expensive. A single power lens can be deployed in different ways. Years ago, in cataract surgery, we only had single vision lenses. Usually, we put distance lenses in both eyes, meaning, meaning glasses were needed to see up close. One notable exception was people who were myopic before cataract surgery. They often preferred to end up myopic afterwards so they could still read without glasses, and they would wear glasses for distance and driving. Another option is monovision. Typically, the dominant eye is set for distance and the other eye is set for near. If people like this with contacts, they could do it with lens implants. More recently, there's another option, a monofocal lens for distance in the dominant eye and a multifocal lens in the non-dominant eye for improved range. These options all worked reasonably well, but the drive for independence from glasses led to changes in strategy. The next type of lens is a multifocal lens. Early versions had two focal distances, but with a difference. One had its focus set at far and near, the other far and intermediate. Because neither proved to be fully satisfactory, it became an option to use one of each type. Newer lenses aim to improve functionality at all three distances. The trifocal lens divides light into three different focal points. Whereas an extended depth of focus lens, EDOF for short, aims to extend the depth of focus to a broader range. 
Both work well, with the trifocal having some advantage at near EDOF, less visual distractions. But multifocal lenses have compromises. There is an initial period of adaptation. Night vision is more likely to have issues with halos and glare and may be generally reduced. Last are the lenses that attempt flexibility. There are several design options, but this is the only one approved in the US. These are motivated by the idea that even late in presbyopia, the ciliary body is still able to contract. So, for a lens in the capsule, it could respond by changing its position and thus its point of focus. The result? Measurements show some flexibility early on, but unfortunately by one to two years out, there is minimal movement, which is usually attributed to the capsule becoming scarred and stiff. With a single vision optic, this lens retains the advantage of good image quality and night vision. Choosing an implant to go with lens replacement surgery is essentially the same as with cataract surgery, except you're not replacing a cloudy lens. Rather, the aim is to improve the ability to see up close without compromising distance vision. While lens implants are not perfect, the results are pretty good and continually improving. There is significantly more in this discussion covered in the video on lens implants. We look at something called defocus curves to show how well each lens performs at different distances. On the practical side, what is the chance of reduced need for glasses? And what is the chance of unwanted visual phenomena like glare and halos? To be complete, lens implant options include an implantable phacic lens. Phacic means your natural lens is still in place, so this implant is an additional lens inside the eye. Functionally, it acts like a contact lens, except being inside the eye means no maintenance. This particular implant is positioned between the iris and the lens. Phacic IOLs were originally used for myopia correction, which has some history we will not cover here. This is an EDOF version for presbyopia that is in development. A reference from the European trial is there, but it is not yet approved in the US. The third and last surgical target is the sclera. The idea of intervention in the sclera has been around for a while. There are two approaches, incisions in the sclera and implants in the sclera. Previous attempts with either of these methods have not been very successful. Here we will look at a couple of attempts to revisit these methods. The first proposal is based on the idea that it is, it is not just the lens that is losing flexibility with age. Changes also occur in the sclera, choroid, ciliary body, etc., which all act to restrict movements normally involved in accommodation. This theory is called visiodynamics. It is not related to the Shakar theory we'll talk about next. Proponents of this theory have developed a surgical approach creating micropores in the sclera in three zones overlying the ciliary muscle in an attempt to restore useful tissue flexibility. Looking at their vision results. Near vision, the green lines at the top show modest improvement from 2032 to 2025, but it was statistically significant. Intermediate improved slightly, but not to a significant level. Distance vision did not change. For the patient's view, they did a multi-part patient satisfaction survey. Overall satisfaction with vision before the procedure started with a rating of minus one. After the procedure, it improved to positive territory at plus 0.33. Ease of near activities improved in parallel with overall satisfaction. This procedure, laser ACE or 
laser, laser scleral microporation is currently awaiting FDA approval. One additional note. This procedure is supposed to work by increasing the flexibility of the sclera. It does not address hardening of the lens. Its proposed use is in the early stage of presbyopia and before lens opacity becomes significant. Once cataract has developed, then cataract surgery is the answer. Another theory of presbyopia is related to the theorized expansion of the lens with time, which may reduce tension on the zonules. This is the Shikar theory discussed in video number one. One strategy for addressing this issue is to expand the sclera in the front part of the eye in an effort to restore tension to the zonules. This proposed treatment is the use of scleral inserts to expand the sclera. Surgery starts with a mechanical device to create a standard size tunnel to medium depth in the sclera. A special inserter is then used to slide the insert through the tunnel with the second part securing it in place. For results of the FDA trial, the reference at the bottom gives you the full report, including the history of the product development. The vision results showed improvement, but statistically fell just below the required confidence interval. Also, adverse effects were a problem. A little over a third of treated eyes had some form of adverse event, most of which were relatively mild surface problems but a significant proportion were in the category of clinical concern. In November of 2020, the FDA Advisory Committee reviewed the results. They felt the risks outweighed the benefits and rejected the application. In summary, presbyopia has been an issue essentially forever. Glasses and contacts have been the traditional treatment, but the effort to move beyond them has been going on for a while. Our exploration into presbyopia has been divided into three detailed subject videos and one summary video. Video one covers what happens in presbyopia and various glasses and contact options. The main issue is loss of flexibility of the natural lens with time. Video number two covers new treatments using eye drops. The newly arriving eye drop op options work by pupil constriction. Further in the future, there may be some restoration of lens flexibility. Surgical approaches have been around for a while and continue to be refined, but they are more invasive and therefore carry more risk. Time will tell how well the various treatment options work versus their cost and side effects.